All right, thank you. So my name is Noor Ahmad, I'm from Columbia. I'm gonna be talking about advanced filter retrieval techniques and tips and tricks. Uh, these are my disclosures. So IBC filters, obviously we know that it's a hot topic in the public right now, or it's been a hot topic in the last, I would say, 10 years. There's a lot of lawyers that are hanging around trying to get you know numbers of patients that have filters and trying to get some money out of this. We've literally at Columbia have had patients um, come in for um, consults and for retrievals with their lawyers, literally on speed dial next to them, hearing about it, which is crazy. So, um, so it's a hot topic in public and especially in metropolitan cities like here. So, types of filters. I always tell my fellows and residents to have a good idea or have it somewhat of an idea of all the different types of filters that are out there. Over the last, I think, 10, 15 years, I think one of you guys showed the timeline, um, filters have exponentially increased in placement. And the types of filters have changed significantly over this last 20 years. So it's important to understand what the different types of filters are because when it comes to retrieving them, it actually changes potentially your retrieval technique uh, depending on that. Some of them, for example, the G2 and G2 Eclipse can break apart pretty easily. So if you use forceps on that, they can literally just fall apart. And that's why it's actually a black box warning for having those filters and those are the people that come in with their lawyers essentially. Um, because they literally just can break up in the renal vein or embolize in the, uh, into the pulmonary artery. So it's really important to understand what type of filter the patient has when they come in for a consult for a retrieval. I tend to get a CT. Um, if they don't have prior imaging, usually they have incidental prior imaging uh, from, for some other reason, but if there's no prior imaging, I tend to get a CT to really understand what type of filter it is if it's fractured, where if it's struts are perforating through any structures, things like that. So um, that's my pre-op workup. So complications of IVC filters, obviously there's fractured legs, there's filters penetrating within the leg, within the aorta. I think you've, uh, you highlighted a lot of these. Um, this is also a case that was, uh, the leg was in the duodenum. Uh, we've successfully removed filters um, with legs through the duodenum. Usually the duodenum collapses on itself when that happens. Um, once we actually did it in conjunction with endoscopy, really just to get pretty pictures, honestly. Uh, IVC filter complications, again, opties, trapeze, uh, these are known to have high occlusion rates. And then certain filter, filters, ex especially as I mentioned earlier, bar types tend to have high fracture rates. So again, it's, I'm not gonna get into the design of filters. That's really another concept to understand of you know, if they're single metal construction, things like that. So. So what makes a difficult retrieval uh, as opposed to a simple retrieval? It's usually these type of patients, that patients that have an embedded hook, their chronicity, if it's greater than six to nine months, I usually say even longer, like greater than um, a year um, or even longer than that. Increased tilt angle, that, make, that can make it difficult. I tend to find, I'm not gonna name companies today, but I tend to find certain filters tend to tilt a lot easier than others. You guys could probably guess what filter I'm talking about. Um, there's filter penetration of the IVC, there's filter fracture long dwell times, uh, and then obviously, obviously filter and thrombus. So Wilco at Stanford, the Stanford IR group, they looked at complex IVC filter retrievals in general and did a prospective study. Um, in 2013, they saw there was a high technical success rate and resolution of symptoms for a lot of these patients. Keep in mind, and I was thinking about this when you were speaking, that these groups, and especially preserve trial, these are high volume areas that uh, are removing these filters. So. Um, it, it's important to understand that high volume areas see, probably have a higher success rate and then when you see quotes from other journals, it's probably like, you know, other uh, not as high volume places that are shown. So real life numbers are probably a little lower than the 90% I think that was in preserve. So complex filter retrieval techniques, I'm going to talk about three of them, wire loop hangman, forceps, laser sheath removal. So wire loop hangman, this is what it is essentially, essentially you're getting a sheath from above. You're using a reverse curve catheter underneath to get a wire around the filter. And again, as you mentioned, it takes skill to understand where to actually land that, uh, land that loop, essentially. Um, and then you thr thread a wire, usually an exchange length wire, snare it, and then create your loop. Uh, the uh, UCLA group, obviously, they published in JVIR back in 2015 that it's effective, it's safe, there's not really much issues when you uh, use it if you're at, right, with skilled operators. So. I'm going to show a case with a hangland loop. This is a 74-year-old male, uh, history of lung cancer, had a filter in. Essentially, I'm just going to kind of cut to the chase, had filter-related thrombosis. This is the CT coronal. You're going to see occluded left, IVs, left uh, iliac that's going into the IVC. Sorry, it's really slow, but that's the clot that we're talking about there. Uh, so how would we take care of this case? So 
First, what I usually do is I get wire access across this of the venograms. Um, again, more venograms showing the thrombosis. So I usually get uh, wire access across, uh, across the filter. I usually do all my work as be while the filter is still in place, uh, just to make sure, uh, again, just no embolization distally, things like that. Clean up the clot as much as possible. Then when we're ready to snare, in this case I did a wire, uh, wire loop hangman's uh, technique. Again, usually um, IJ, I usually get a 16 to 18 French sheet, sometimes bigger. Uh, put a SOS catheter, reverse curve catheter under the filter, snare that wire with a gooseneck, and then create that loop, right? That's what we did there. And then sometimes you need to actually use a balloon to actually uh, inflate the uh, hook off the wall. So I usually use about an eight or a 10 millimeter balloon, sometimes a 12. Depending on where I could thread it, it's key to actually thread the wire from below across the side of where the filter is, right? Uh, once you kind of balloon it off, you can actually snare it uh, from above and retrieve it, as we did here. And this was the post. There was a residual, uh, there was a residual filling defect here, which we ended up actually stenting, um, and the patient did had great flow afterwards. So. Forceps, it's actually my favorite out of them. It is dangerous. I tell my trainees that it can be very dangerous when you're using forceps. Um, you can have, I think Amir showed some cases, you can have perforation, you can actually have injury of artery, renal arteries, things like that. So it's important to be really comfortable, especially uh, early, in, early in your career or, else, or during training to actually really get that comfort level as high as possible. Uh, the pen group uh, showed there recently, I think it was in 2023 this year, Basically, uh, they published their experience with um, uh, endobronchial forceps. Again, this is a high volume group that's publishing their data. Just keep that in mind. And of course, they showed that it, it was they had high, really high success rates and it was safe. Um, people always ask, especially cardiologists, what forceps I use. Um, this is the forceps we use at Columbia. And if anyone wants to take a picture and order it for their home institution, that's what this is here. I found it kind of funny on the website. It said this. Uh, interventionally using it with great success. Uh, they're retrieving it from the IVC and redeploying within the SVC. I don't know who's doing that, but I guess some people are doing that. All right. So you have a 50, this is a 58 year old female, uh, history of subarachnoid bleed in 2013 with a chronic TVT and filter. This was a Greenfield filter. My technique, and I always tell the trainees, is to not, uh, to actually unsheath your forceps, you don't want to actually try to, you don't want to jam your forceps forward because that can cause perforations, things like that. So I get the sheath almost just above, usually actually I try to get it below and then pull it back. Um, I probably did that in this case and just brought it back. Um, but then you're going to unsheath your forceps. So it's an eight, I use an 18 French by 45 centimeter cook sheath, uh, 16, you can use a 16 French at least for the forceps that we use. Um, and these are alligator forceps essentially. Um, and in this case, what I, what I tend to do, a lot of these times the filter is actually like angled on the IVC. So I can do one of two things is I use at the neck, I kind of torque the sheath kind of medially or laterally depending on where the, um, uh, where the filter hook is. And then sometimes I actually open up the forceps. I spin it to actually kick the filter off the wall and then grab it like that, which I did in this case, essentially. Um, so. Uh, once we grasped it, hopefully I'll grasp it soon. There we did, right there. And it came out nice and easily, so that was it. So this is a Greenfield filter that was in for a while that uh, came out, so flow afterwards was nice, essentially. Uh, I'm at a Sinai conference, so I have to show an inverted filter, of course. So this is a uh, filter that, uh, to be honest, I've actually really bought into this technique. I know there are people around the country that are really scared doing this, which I totally get and understand. It's usually, it's really good for option elite filters because they actually invert really nicely. They can be angled from one side to the other. And I pick my access depending on what size it's angled. I get the, I use a 24 French sheath um, that, gets right, that gets right into the middle of the apex and then put your forceps right up, you know, where the hook is and then just pull it down through it, which we did in this case, essentially. So it's a nice uh, kind of easy technique that, not easy, I would say. It's dangerous because it, you can still have fractures of um, filter legs. You wanna, you're worried about perforating that forceps through the IVC and things like that. So, But it's a nice kind of technique in your toolbox to kind of keep in mind. So this is a patient, a 50-year-old female, um, lupus, multiple thromboembolic uh, events, uh, had two filters placed, 2011, 2014. I'm not sure why. 
bilateral lower extremity swelling, progressive DVTs. He, uh, she had a Gunther tulip on the top and then the optes at the bottom here. Uh, below the, uh, below the, actually I believe it's a trapeze. Um, below the trapeze there's a complete occlusion of the IVC, um, which you're seeing here on both sides, essentially. So again, get access across here. <clears throat> we got wire access across from both sides. I was pretty aggressively just removing this filter out with, um, so trapeze and optes, and I'll talk about on the laser side, I usually use laser if I can get a good grasp of the filter from the bottom. Above and below, this was not nice, and this is why it's important you want to have uh, access across. There's extra after uh, removing that filter. But fortunately, because you have access across, you can use a balloon, basically tamping all that. Uh, and everyth actually, everything ended up turning up fine. Frequently with trapezes and optes filters, whenever you remove them, either it's forceps or laser in particular, in general, whenever you lose laser, and I'll talk about that in the next uh, part, you can frequently get bleeding and small pseudoaneurysms next to it. So just always you want to have make sure you have your balloon within the, in the room uh, when you're doing those. And then the top filter, the Gunther Tulip, we took out with uh, forceps. And then these are the two filters at the end. Laser. I don't use laser often, and maybe some of you guys on the panel, or you know, anyone in the crowd, could tell me. I, the reason being is that I can't use a forceps through a laser yet, and it really has to do with the length of the device that's out there. Um, the sheath that's out there. So, before the lasers were Spectronetics lasers, and now Philips basically used Spectronetics or bought out Spectronetics, and renamed it to CavaClear. Then essentially, it's the same. Um, laser that's out there, so the only laser that's out there that's FDA approved for uh, filter removals. Uh, Kush Desai, who was here earlier, he did a, uh, they, uh, this large group did a um, study showing that CavaClear works very well. This led to the FDA approval um, of CavaClear and that's how it's being marketed. So just to keep, keep people, kind of keep the perspective in play, laser is routinely used for pacer wires in the chest. And in my head, it's a little more dangerous using a laser um, in the chest, removing pacer wires. So when we're using it in filter, for filters, I feel like there is a risk, but there, just understand that it's be, it has been widely used for many years up in the chest. Um, so I think people kind of worry about the bleeding risk and things like that with laser. The only thing with laser uh, for me is that hooks need to actually be the kind of dead center or a little off. If they're embedded in the wall, you have to find a way to actually, you have to probably use a wire loop snare to actually pull it off the wall and then get that laser around. You can't, again, as I said, you can't use forceps, at least the forceps that we have. We can't use forceps through the laser, so. This was a 51-year-old uh, patient, had a filter placed at an outside hospital. Multiple attempts were made at um, removing, which were unsuccessful. They actually came for adrenal vein sampling and uh, initially, and we needed to remove the filter prior to that, so. This was a filter. This was a nice case to use laser because the hook was, it's been in there for a while. People have tried using, snaring it out, um, unsuccessful. So basically we were able to use a snare, gooseneck snare, get around the filter, which is here. And this is literally a, like a five minute case. So if you actually see, this is, this is the way you do it. You get neck access, you get 18 by 45 centimeter sheath. Um, the laser comes in 16 French and 18 French systems. We can use a 16 French, which it could be, the spectronetics were actually smaller. Um, and then you're using the outer sheath as like a dissector almost. Once you get the laser around the hook right here, you're literally turning on the laser for like a couple of seconds, you're inching millimeters. Because you can actually perf right through the IVC wall pretty quickly. So you want to go really slow as you're turning on the laser. And then while you're kind of inching away, you're, you're, literally, you're lasering it, and then you're advancing the sheath to dissect the uh, tissue around it. So that's what we did here. This literally came out in less than, I think, a minute after we turned on the laser. So it was really nice. Uh, that's the removal. So we turned on the laser, and then you actually use the outer sheath to dissect it out. So I think this is my last case. 36-year-old female, factor V light in, had an optese filter. Multiple attempts were removed. We came, came to Columbia for a second opinion. This is the optese. This was actually fractured. There were fragments of the optes that were fractured. So the plan was initially to actually gain access from above and below. I did a wire loop snare technique from below, which is here. I didn't for some reason, maybe I don't know why we didn't get access or what, but we didn't actually wire loop from the top, but we actually just lasered it from the bottom and it actually pulled right through um, with the uh, wire loop snare. And then we left, these fragments were there. So again, as I said, 
whenever you use laser, you can have this, this is pretty typical, um, this type of bleed, but you always wanna have a wire, well, we don't have wire here access, but you wanna just quickly get wire access across and put a balloon up, and these usually tamponade pretty well um, afterwards, so. And that's actually the final picture, so that's all I have. Thank you.